Hi, my name is Brad Neal. Let's talk about a crash course on hybridization. So in previous uh, videos, we talked about molecular structure using um, our Vesper model. Vesper is really cool and all, um, but if we stop and we think, okay, how do we make something like a tetrahedral around a carbon atom? Um, yeah, it makes sense that the electrons want to be apart from one another. These are the atomic orbitals that we have to work with. These are the atoms that would be around a central carbon in order to make a tetrahedral. So we've got this sphere, this S orbital, and we've got these P orbitals that kind of look a bit like dumbbells if you squint. So how are you going to get these things to orient themselves such that we're going to be able to have a four coordinate system uh, for orbitals to overlap because we're saying in order for orbitals to or for a bond to be formed we need to have the atomic orbitals overlap to form these bonds between atoms um, and it just it doesn't really jive right so how are you going to be able to get something that's pointed in the uh, in this direction the x direction the y direction and the z direction to really form a 109.5 degree bond angle um, so atomic orbitals by themselves aren't going to be able to explain the real world phenomena that Vesper uh, predicts for us. So it's time to start thinking about a new model of where electrons are around an atom or specifically um, a way to think about why they might be where they are. So these are our atom, or I'm sorry, these are our orbitals that are, we're going to find around something like carbon. Um, we said, yeah, they're not going to form those 109.5 degree bond angles. What happens if we take all of these atomic orbitals and we put them into something like, say, a blender? Um, and what happens when we pour them out? So this is whenever I give uh, a nice little analogy. Uh, well, first off, I give a shout out to Blend Tech Blenders and their uh, wonderful video series, Will It Blend? They blend almost anything in their blenders. It's amazing. Uh, don't check it out right the second. Check it out after you watch the video, but man, they're really cool. Um, what's I got to do with this? Well, think about making a smoothie. When you make a smoothie, you're going to be adding in uh, maybe like one part yogurt, one part strawberry, one part blueberry, and one part banana because you're like me and you like fruit and you don't want kale because kale is terrible. When you then put one part of all of those different ingredients in to your blender, you blend it all up. It becomes this nice homogeneous mixture. You can't really tell the banana anymore. And you might be able to tell the blueberry just because of the color, um, the strawberry because of the seeds, but that's kind of it. That's otherwise indistinguishable. It's not that at the very end, you only end up with one portion of smoothie, at least if you're me. You end up with four portions of smoothie because I, whenever I'm making a smoothie anyways, I add in like one serving of yogurt, one serving of blueberry, one serving of strawberry, one serving of banana, which means at the end I end up with four total servings of my smoothie. That's going to be the same kind of thing that's going to happen here with our uh, atomic orbitals. We're going to add all of our atomic orbitals up put them in this blender, mix them all up, and we're going to get four new orbitals out at the other end. And this is what we see. We get the combination of all of these orbitals turning into what we call sp3 hybrids. Now we have four of these sp3 hybrid orbitals. And the sp3 tells us a lot about the look and the shape of these resulting four orbitals that come out on the other side. So they've got this kind of dumbbellish character like the p orbitals have, but they are a little bit more squat uh, than the p orbitals were by themselves. They've got a little bit of this s character. So we could think of this as them having one part S character and three part P character for these hybrid orbitals. 
Now, I'm not going to show you the math, but really, if we think back to the definition of what these orbitals are and we go into wave function stuff, um, this is these orbitals were really a representation of where we would expect to find electron density, and they're based off of mathematical equations. It's a mathematical equation. So if we add our mathematical equations out um, and we get four new mathematical equations as our result, this is what they would end up looking like. So we typically draw them um, more kind of like what this drawing over here has. Um, and it's this one is being uh, labeled as our hybrids all shown together. Because what we really find is that they're all resulting around the same central atom. So here in the center would be our central atom. And the different shadings are just different phases of the same orbital. So this blue phase up here and this orange phase down here are just the two phases of this one, this single sp3 orbital. So this is one sp3 orbital. This is a second one, a third one, a fourth one. So if we blend atomic orbitals together, we get hybrid orbitals out. And it's important to note for every one orbital that we add into our blender, we're going to get that number of hybrid orbitals out. So if we add an S and three different 2P orbitals, we end up with four orbitals total that we've added, so four hybrid orbitals out on the back side. These orbitals all have this different orientation in space. And if you check it out, the orientation here approximately has a 109.5 degree angle. And that is what Vesper would predict. So hybrid orbitals, this hybridization and Vesper seem to actually jive pretty well with one another in terms of hybridization seems to predict well the or the bond angles that we would really protect from Vesper and that we actually see. Now we've talked in chapter seven, something like that with our atomic structure. And we were able to say uh, these energy diagrams, something that looked like this. If we draw out the ground state for or the ground state electron configuration for carbon, we said it was 2s2, 2p2. Um, here's our 2s orbitals, and it's got two electrons in it. And here's our 2p orbitals. Now, we only had two electrons here. In order for us to form these hybridized orbitals, what we have to do first before we can put them in the, all in the blender is we actually have to take one of our electrons from that 2s, and we have to promote it. We have to get it into an excited state so that we now have a single electron in every single one of our atomic orbitals. Once we have them in our atomic orbitals, then we can put it in the blender and we can get the hybrid orbitals out. Now the hybrid orbitals, these, this one, one, two, three, four of the, the four sp3 orbitals are going to have an energy value that is the average of this s orbital and the three 2p orbitals. So the hybrid orbitals are somewhere here in the middle. Um, and so that is a way for us to think about why energetically this is allowed to happen. Because remember, Mother Nature is lazy and she does not want to do something uh, if it costs energy. And so this hybridization, ultimately, yeah, you might think like, oh, it's going to require energy. But we end up saving energy as well by having all of these orbitals uh, now lower energy than the original P orbitals were. Uh, it's a little bit higher than the S orbital, but... Overall, it works for us. So here's our sp3 orbitals again. The overlap between these new orbitals that we have allow for us to form something like a tetrahedral. So if you draw out methane for yourself, CH4, you have hydrogen atoms that are in the terminal position around a carbon. The carbon we would say has three sp3 hybrid orbitals that look like this around it. So right here in the center, we could say this is our carbon. The s, the one s orbital around our hydrogens are now free and available to have overlap between the blue region on this sp3 orbital, 
this sp3 orbital this sp3 orbital and this sp3 orbital because we're allowed to have that overlap um, and we have one electron in each of these hybrid orbitals the one electron that's in the hydrogen's 1s orbital they can interact and form a bond and look they're sharing a pair of electrons now so hybridization is actually pretty good for helping us understand bonding as well we don't have to blend all of our p orbitals though we can hold one of them back in reserve so we could blend a 2s a 2p and a 2p this means we're not blending one of our p orbitals so if we only blend three total atomic orbitals we get three total hybrid orbitals out these are going to be called our sp2 hybrid orbitals please note they have p characteristic they've got these two different phases but they've also got a little bit more s characteristic than our three than our sp3 hybrid orbitals had the orientation in space that they have minimizing repulsions is in this kind of triangle space so you could almost say that these things make some kind of trigonal planar arrangement this final image that we have over here on the right is going to be all of those orbitals around the black dot and the black dot is the central atom so all of these outer lobes just like in the case of the sp3 hybrid orbital are pointed out at 120 degrees from one another so we now have a situation where if we blend only two of our p orbitals we can and with one of our s orbitals we can end up with one two three atomic orbitals forming one two three hybrid orbitals the name has changed it's an s p two it's one part s character two part p character 120 degree bond angles come from this if we look at our electron geom or our electron energies and now if we take for example something like boron um boron has 2s2 1 2 no 2s2 2p1 for its electron configuration in the ground state and we've got that drawn out here as well same thing as with carbon if we promote one of our electrons from the ground state up to a higher excited state we now have something like this um, and here when we do the hybridization we're not going to take all of our p orbitals we're only going to take the ones that have electrons in there uh, or the ones that we want to blend and now we end up with three sp2 orbitals here again in this middle uh, energy level for the same reasons as we talked about with the sp3s however the sp2 that we did not use i'm sorry the 2p that we did not use stays at the same energy level so overall we started before hybridization with one two three four atomic orbitals and at the end we end up with one two three hybrid orbitals and one atomic orbital so it's not like oh we didn't use this atomic orbital so we could throw it away it's not like an extra piece in an ikea furniture set um, which never actually happens you always have less pieces in an ikea set um, or legos for that matter um, we have to retain these things if they're there before they have to in some way shape or form exist once the hybridization is done so we just described the energies there so what does this kind of thing look around look like around an atom and so this is where i'm going to now attempt to draw what that would actually look like for us so we turn on our video broadcasting majig and we hit the right button wrong button still there's the right button and here we go all right first off we said that our hybrid orbitals looked something like this and oops that's pretty terrible let's try that again this would be one of our sp2s and we had three of these total and the region out here is going to be 120 degrees from the other region that would be out there so if i draw another one try to draw it on top of it this should be 120 degrees and then if i try to draw another one 
this should try to be 120 degrees. Cool. So far, I haven't shown you anything that you didn't see on the slides. The thing that you didn't see on the slides was we still have this 2p orbital that's still just hanging out. So this is where the fancy drawing is going to have to come into play. So here we go. So to draw this, I'm going to take this structure and I'm going to rotate it a little bit. So right now it's in the plane of the page. I'm going to try to rotate it uh, to indicate that one uh, lobe is now going away from us and one lobe is uh, coming towards us. So we have one lobe that's in the plane of the page, just like normal. And then, like I just said, we're going to have one that's going away from us. So to help me draw that, I'm going to use our dash notation here. And then we're going to have one wedge that's coming out towards us. And that's not a great way of drawing that. What the what? Let's try drawing that a little bit better. And then I'm going to use a wedge. And I don't know who ever said drawing on an iPad was really easy and effortless. It's maybe better than nothing, but it's better drawing on a screen where you can't, I suppose. Okay, so here's our wedge. So we've got this orbital coming out, this orbital right here in the plane of the page, and then this one is going away from us. That P orbital that we said is still there, it's just not being used, now is going to exist right still there around our central atom. Let me try to draw that a little bit better. It's going to, and the phase between the atoms or the, the two lobes is different, but it's going to remain right where it is. So this is our P orbital and this is our P orbital that is remaining. This is our SP2, this is an SP2, and this is an SP2 orbital. Why is this important? Well, it's important because if we take this and we somehow are able to copy it, uh, copy, and we paste, and then and then we paste, and then we rotate like this, then what we can see, I'm gonna get rid of the naming, what we can see is we have a lobe here and a lobe there that can have direct in overlap with one another. So just like with the way we described the hydrogen 1s orbital interacting with the uh, hybrid orbital, the sp3 hybrid orbital, we can have two different sp2 hybrid orbitals directly overlap with one another. The advantage of doing that is we can have them do something like this. And now we have formed ourselves a nice little single bond. Groovy, fantastic. I'm gonna erase the phasing here because we need that phasing to be different uh, for the next thing we're about to do. There we go, like that. Okay, so right here, we're gonna call that a single bond or in the parlance, a sigma bond. Sigma, and a sigma bond means a single bond. We have a direct, direct overlap of orbitals. Why are we putting this designation over things that have direct overlap? Well, because we can have through space interactions between orbitals as well. So those P orbitals that are remaining the, um, the 
thing that I just erased and then I redrew, we can have through space interaction between these two different lobes of the p orbitals. So uh, right in the, let's see here, this thing right here is one p orbital. This thing right here is another p orbital. They're oriented in space in the same direction, so both up and down. If they both have one electron in them, they can kind of feel each other through space and they can share that electron. And that through space interaction forms a new kind of bond. That kind of bond is called a pi bond. Pi bond. In the parlance that we've used up until this point, but we didn't really know why, this would be called a double bond. So the what we've got here in the blue overlapping region is our sigma bond, which is res which results in the single bond that we see. And what we have in the red is our is our pi bond. Now the pi bond, to be really clear about this, includes the top and the bottom here. Both of those light blue highlighted regions, that's the same bonding region. That's not three total bonds, it's two regions. The one that is in the dark blue, high, or the dark blue that's scribbled, as well as the blue highlighting. We could also do the same kind of thing with to form a triple bond. Um, and it just, it's the same kind of drawing, but instead of using uh, sp2, orbitals, we would have sp hybrid orbitals, and the two remaining p orbitals that are left would be used to form two pi bonds um, on top of that. Because you have two different pi bonds plus one sigma bond for a triple bond, we'd say you have three total bonds. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the big... Uh, overview of hybridization. So if you go to the uh, chart that um, we have shown before, and I think it's something like this one. Cool. So if you go to the chart that we've had before, um, you're going to see on, let's go one more slide. You're going to see on these various diagrams here, that we have our electron pair geometry written out and then our hybridization in parentheses. So this would be our electron pair geometry. Oops, this would be our electron pair geometry and when parentheses is our hybridization. So note, when we have trigonal planar, we have uh, a steric number of three. Well, that was what we just drew right back here. We have a trigonal planar look with, S, with three sp2 hybrid orbitals. And that is what our, our summary sheet says as well. That's the punchline between hybrid orbitals. Please check out your reading to see some more advanced drawings of these things. And uh, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you very much.